Welcome to episode 75 of Film Courage. My name is Karen Warden. My name is David Brandon. We are thrilled. Very thrilled. To have actor Todd Cattell here in the studio with us. He's a longtime friend. He is one of the most dedicated actors that we know. Um, you're going to soon see him in the movie Goodbye Promise. Um, and we'd also like to mention that he is the guy who inspired the Film Courage moniker. Yeah. So, you know, if you will. So Welcome. This is one way we give back to him. Yes. Todd, thank you for joining us here in studio. Thank you, uh, it's a pleasure to be here, David and Karen. Really an honor. Our featured guest today is one of the most praised directors of independent cinema. John's lengthy list of projects include Mate Wan, Passion Fish, The Brother from Another Planet, Honey Dripper, Eight Men Out, Sunshine State, and many more incredible films. Indeed. John Sayles' latest work is entitled Amigo, which premieres at the 35th Toronto International Film Festival on Tuesday, September 14th. That's two days from today. Okay. Um, in addition to filmmaking, John is an author of screenplays, short stories, plays, and several books, including a new novel entitled A Moment in the Sun, set around 1900. It's the same era as the movie Amigo, mm -hmm. also um, in the Philippines, which is going to be published by McSweeney's in May of 2011. Please welcome to the Film Courage program, Mr. John Sales. Hello, John. Thank you Hi, how are you doing? Doing well. We, you Very know, pleased to have you. Once again, we are thrilled to have you join Very us here today, wonderful. John. Um, thank you. All right, well, thank you again, John, for joining us today. Now, you've been a storyteller for many years. How old were you when you began writing stories? Oh, I was probably about um, eight or ten when I could start to write, and I just I, I mostly um, wrote stories about the kids in my neighborhood uh, having adventures that were ripped off from the TV series The Untouchables. So uh, somehow the kids in this very rural neighborhood in Burnt Hills, New York, were fighting the Capone mob. Hmm, interesting. Okay, <laughs> and okay. from. Watching your films and uh, listening to your various interviews, you know, we've gathered that you have an incredibly clear grasp on human beings and the world around you, and you show this quality in your work without judgment of your subjects. I mean, were you always like this? Were you a keen observer as a child? Yeah, well, you know, it, it's, I think the observer comes out of being curious. You know, mm -hmm. I've, I've often said that, uh, you know, both the fiction that I write and uh, the movies that I've made a lot of it comes from this feeling of if this is the way people are acting, what could possibly be going on in their heads? Um, so I, I, I think I've always, you know, in, including in my fiction and as well in the movies, uh, been interested in not necessarily judging people, but figuring out why they're doing what they're doing. Okay. You know, and putting them in a in a dramatic situation where they they sometimes have to do some, you know. Uh, make some difficult choices. And I also read that you went to Williams College in Massachusetts and mm -hmm. you had a great education. However, you shunned most corporate jobs and were curious about this. It seemed that you were attracted to more industrious work and were wondering... Well, I, I wouldn't say shun is the word. I, I don't <laughs> think I could have gotten a corporate job uh, when I got out. Of, you know, I got out of... Uh, college in 1972 with a uh, uh, you know BA in psychology okay. which was not especially useful uh -huh. um, you know and so I, I and I had been working you know since I was in high school summers um, you know just to make money so I, I went back to immediately went back to what I'd done before uh, working in factories and hospitals um, so it wasn't actually shunning. I just got the best job that I could. Okay. And then eventually I got lucky, and uh, a couple of years after I was out of college, I got a union job as a meat packer, and which paid probably about four times what um, minimum wage back then was about a dollar or dollar ten an hour. And uh, meat packing, at least the job that I got was was about four forty an hour. So that mm -hmm. was a a huge step up for me. Mm -hmm. um, and and also kind of meant that I was able to, you know, start writing a little bit more because I had a little uh, a little less scuffling around for money. Um, this is Film Courage on LATalkRadio.com. We are on the line with filmmaker John Sales, whose new movie, Amigo, is having its world premiere at the Toronto International Film Festival on September 14th. And once again, that's in two days. Um, John, you are a prolific writer bouncing off your own scripts to, to Hollywood rewrites, um, to novels. You know, and almost every writer that we know 
is also an avid reader. You know, do, do you read more than you write? You know, I don't get to read just fiction as much as I'd like to. Um, I, I do an awful lot of research reading for um, uh, screenwriting jobs that I'm either doing or auditioning for, because you have to audition for a screenwriting job these days. Um, and some of that's really, really interesting. For my novel, A Moment in the Sun, I probably read a hundred books, oh, a wow. few of them in Spanish, um, just to feel like I was well-grounded enough to, to, to write about certain things. So I get to do that kind of reading, but just reading for fun, I, I really get to do anymore. I used to do a lot more of it. Um, and uh, it's something that, you know, if I'm unemployed, I actually get to do a little bit. Uh, John, this is Todd here. I just had a quick question about what you said. Uh, when you say you have to audition for, for one of the writing jobs, which is kind of surprising given uh, your <laughs> your resume, but nonetheless, when you say that, what do you do? You provide a certain sample that they want in, in that particular no, genre. No, you, you can't really write anything down on paper um, without them hiring you. You know, I'm I'm in the the Screenwriters Guild, uh, mm -hmm. the Writers Guild of America East. Um, what what the the general um, way that people get screenwriting jobs these now uh, these days is uh, your name is put up for a, a job, and it may be a rewrite, it may be an original, it may be a polish even, um, by your agent. And usually the studio involved will talk to five, six, seven, eight, depending on how much patience they have for the process, different writers, and they want to hear your take on it. They want to hear what you would do if you were the writer. Um, and, you know, that can be, a, an, in my case, because I don't live in Los Angeles, um, an hour or two sometimes on the phone, uh, sometimes talking back and forth, sometimes you just do your pitch, this is the way I see this, you know, thing, you know, being structured or whatever, um, and quite honestly, you, you usually never hear from them again, <laughs> and, <laughs> and they, they may hire yet another writer that they didn't, you know, they may you know, be taking notes and mm -hmm. say, oh, that's uh, very interesting, and that's it, and, you know, keep some of your ideas, and you know, it's it's not something that writers like, but it's pretty much the way you get work now, or at least the way that I get work now. Mm. Right. And John, how, how much time do you generally devote to writing each of your stories? I mean, do you tend to focus on one project at a time, or, or are you consistently overlapping projects? Because I imagine, um, if, you know... If, if I'm lucky and I'm well-employed, usually what happens is, um, just because of, uh, of the, the reading period that it takes people to take, I usually have two going on at any one time, and so, you know, I hand one in, and they'll take two, three, four weeks to read it and respond to it, and in that time, I'm, I'm writing the other one. I actually write very fast when I know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. uh, I know what I'm doing if I've done the research, but also the, the speed with which I can write also depends on the meetings that I've had with the people who are, are you know, paying for the screenplay. Um, and how clear they've been able to be. If they're just fishing, if their statements are very vague, then it takes you longer because you're really inventing the story. Mm -hmm. um, if they're, you know, I've written screenplays, I did a rewrite once of a, a modern-day samurai movie in three days mm -hmm. because the producers needed it in three days to get a certain actor to give a green light to the project so they could, you know, get to make it. Um, generally, I'll write a screenplay in about two weeks, um, put it aside, not think about it for a week, and then pick it up and do you know my own rewrite on it before I send it in. So you know it, it really varies with with the mandate that I've been given, but uh, I'm lucky in that you know once I know where I'm going, I write pretty fast. John, so your films are you know, remarkably diverse, and it would seem. That diversity emerges from your insatiable cultural curiosity and fascination with human nature. Could you speak specifically to what has triggered those moments within you when you decide to invest a year or more of your life in telling a particular story on film? Yeah, I, I, I think it boils down to interest. And the interest may have been there for years and years and years and years. Um, you know, uh, you mentioned uh, Lone Star before. Lone Star kind of probably began when I watched you know, uh, Davy Crockett on the wonderful world of Disney when I was a little kid <laughs> right. and had this, this one idea of what the, the story of the Alamo was. 
And then the first time I got to go to San Antonio and went to, the, to see the real Alamo, uh, there was a demonstration outside of it of uh, Mexican Americans basically saying, let's, let's hear the whole story. And then I got interested in the story of the Alamo, and, and eventually I started thinking about, first of all, Texas, which um, is its own deal. <laughs> you know, it's, <laughs> right. You know, Texas was a republic for nine years or so, and, and there's a lot of people who still feel like you know, it's an ally of the United States, not necessarily one of the United States. Um, I got thinking about Texas, but also the, the legends of Texas, and what happens when a legend starts to be destructive rather than constructive? You know, wh- why do we have legends, and what hap- you know, can they cause trouble? As, as well as be a wonderful thing that tells us who we are. Um, and, and that kind of a, ended up sparking into, well, what if, what if I was to do something on the Texas border and deal with that thing of, of you know, what, what people think their past was as opposed to what it really was. Right. Wow, that's... So, so it, it may be a long process. Um, mm-hmm. You know, certainly this, this uh, uh, movie Amigo that, that we're going to be premiering at the Toronto Film Festival tomorrow, uh, I, I wrote a screenplay uh, that, that had to do with that era maybe 15 years ago. Uh, I put it aside because it was clear we were never going to get enough money to make that ambitious a screenplay. Um, then I started thinking, well, you know, if I made it into a novel, I could expand it rather than trying to squeeze even more into a two-hour period. Uh, and then I went back on a trip to the Philippines to look at some of the places that were mentioned in the novel and get a, you know, t- to see them with my own eyes rather than just read about them. And I started talking to our friend Joel Torrey, who was a very well-known Filipino actor, about Philippine movies and how much they cost, and realized, you know, I, I could make a movie set in that era, a kind of micro history, and and if we we did all our shooting and post in the Philippines, actually afford to make a, a fairly ambitious movie for a fairly low budget, you know, and and mm. and that kind of started leading to the idea for a story. Uh, so, you, and your scripts are quite meticulously structured it would seem and it is my guess that the the dialogue we hear when sitting in the theater is essentially verbatim to that which you wrote on the page and yet there is an inherently authentic and sort of seamlessly spontaneous quality to the character interactions on screen in your films would you share a bit about the collaborative process with your actors in general that allows for that authenticity and in particular with your stalwarts uh, Chris Cooper, David Strathairn and Chris Christopherson among others yeah, I, 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 one, one other thing is hire good actors. <laughs> that always <laughs> helps. Um, you know, I, I, I don't tend to change lines or, or have, you know, actors ad lib or paraphrase even on the set. Uh, you know, I'll write everything, at, at least everything in English, um, down and really work on it. Uh, one of the things that I do is I was an actor before I was a writer or a director. I go through and I play every part. You know, I just I just mm-hmm. kind of highlight you know one character's you know dialogue, and I say, okay, if I had to play this part mm-hmm. now that I've said these lines out loud, is there enough there? Am I an interesting person? Do I know where I'm coming from? Um, and so usually the secondary characters get a you know it may be only two more lines, or they may end up being related to somebody else in the movie, and you know, I draw a couple more connective lines uh, mm-hmm. to, to anchor that character in the story a little bit more. Then one of the things that I do in the process is I write a bio for every character. Mm-hmm. If you have two lines, you get a short bio. If, you have, if you're the lead, you probably get a three-page you know, bio. But um, it's the stuff that's, that might be helpful to an actor about um, who the character is, uh, where they just came from, what they think about things that are not necessarily spelled out in the script that I think might be helpful. And those bios go to those actors well, that's um, as soon as we cast them. So that they could have them for weeks or months, or in the case of our movies where the, the money falls apart, years. Um, right. And, uh, and then I just say, call me up if you have a question. So for, for, for two reasons. One is that I don't do rehearsals. I don't do even a read-through. Uh, I don't have the money to pay the actors for one thing or, mm-hmm. or get them all in the same room because they come from all over the country or all over the world in some cases. 
Mm. And the other is that I want that kind of shock of the new um, there. I want to put a bunch of actors who absolutely know who their characters are, who are good, hardworking actors, and they know their lines and everything. I want them to put them in that situation. And it is absolutely harder to do take 10 um, as new and as surprised and, and as fresh as it is to do take one. Agreed. I love or that. Or two or three. <laughs> I love you know, that. That's just, fantastic. That you, yeah. It's just one of the tough, you know, as opposed to theater acting where, you know, you get this great thing of you, 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 you know the play and every night is different because it's a different audience and everything, but you only do it once that night. You don't go back and, and you know, there's directors who, you know, until they hear some strange note that only they can hear, they'll have you do it over and over and over and over and over. And maybe they're trying to break down what you usually do, but it, it usually means that they can't articulate what they want. Um, I'm much more of the school of I'm going to do it two or three times, and each time I'm going to make a you know give a direction to the actor, and and that that's all it is is well let's go left instead of right or try to hide your anger a little bit more this time or whatever. Um, and then I usually just say to the actor, okay, I'm happy. I've got what I need for the editing room. Is there anything you want to do or can mm-hmm. think of that you want to do mm-hmm. that you haven't done yet? You know, and then you may do one or two more for the actor. Right. Wow, mm-hmm. that's, that's, yeah, that's a dream come true for an actor right there. It sounds mm-hmm. like a pleasure. <laughs> yeah, and then, and then the other thing that, that I really concentrate on is um, actors need other actors support to support them. So, you know, what, what you try to do is, I, I always think of it as being the corner man for two fighters, but you're the corner man for both fighters, and, and what you want is a good, lively fight. So I, I, I tend to take the actors separately and say, okay, this time, you know, don't let your mother push you around. <laughs> you know, right, whatever. Right, right. And then you may change the dynamic from to the mother, um, and you're not tricking them. You're just you're just giving them each something to come into the ring with that's slightly different than the last time. So you've changed the dynamic, um, and you know, and then you just see what happens with that new dynamic. Um, and so, really, what you want your actors doing is not looking to you, but um, taking care of business with the the other people who are on screen with them. You know, and and that, that's the great thing about working with good actors is they really play off each other. And if, if the actor throws something different at them, they've got to react to it in a different way. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and is the, are those, those, those bits of direction that you're giving uh, take to take, is that coming uh, for you spontaneously in that moment? Or do you, uh, along with writing out the bios and sort of acting out the scenes um, that you've written in each part, do you, do you make those decisions and say, I have a list of five or six things I'm going to suggest to David or to Chris? And, and uh, it, You know, I almost never do. Really, the, 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 the first thing you want to do is see what the actors are going to come up with themselves because it may not be something that you have thought of. Mm-hmm. You might like it a whole lot better than what you have thought of. <laughs> right. so, so, so all that prep is before we get to the set, and then it's just like, okay, you know, you try to do a no acting rehearsal so that people, you know, don't wander, you know, out of where the camera can keep them in focus. Um, but, but, you know, you're not really talking about the dynamics of the scene yet until you see people do it a couple times. And I use an awful lot of first take stuff, you know, because the actors right. come up with something really interesting and they won't necessarily do it again. You know, there are actors who are brilliant on the first take and then they start to second guess themselves. Um, what you eventually try to do is handicap the actors and you know like Chris Cooper is an actor who you can have him with a camera behind him for three quarters of the day doing a a long scene and just say Chris you know just okay use this time but we're not going to point at your face until about halfway through the afternoon Uh, and then he'll have used that time and he'll be terrific when you turn around and point at him and he'll have really helped the other actor through the scene there are other actors who you really, you really just say, okay, you know what you're doing? Let's go. And you get one or two great takes out of them, and then you say, I loved it, and we're not going to point the camera at you anymore because they, they're starting to second-guess themselves and you know, get self-conscious or whatever. And, right. and you, you have to learn that about actors very quickly so you know how to cover a scene in a way that's going to be the best for each of the actors in the scene. Do you find that the actors are aware of that themselves? 
that they're uh, like not necessarily. First okay. um, actors all. I always ask an actor, "How do you like to work, and how do you work best?" Um, and some of them are very self-aware, and others really don't want to be self-aware. And you try to help that. Hmm. You know, there there are actors who say, "Oh, give me a line reading. I don't care. I'll make it my own." And others where you don't really want to finish a sentence with them because then they're going to feel too constrained. And you you know. You're there to, to direct their talents, not teach them how to act. Um, you know, you wouldn't have hired them if you didn't think they could act. Right. Um, the other thing that, that, that is difficult as a director is that you've, you know, in my case, I've written these lines. In, in some cases, I've heard them said by, you know, 50 people in auditions. So I've seen that scene 50 times with actors, not even the ones who are going to be in the movie in it. Right. Um, is to, to have it be new to you. So one of the things that I do is I, I do a lot of prep so that I know what I want out of the day. And then I try to, just like a good actor does, f- between takes or between shows if they're on theaters, forget everything and just come to it very new and say, okay, is, are these people making me watch them? What's going on here? What do I feel? Could I get more out of this thing? Um, on Amigo, you know, half of, half of the dialogue is in Tagalog. I don't speak any Tagalog. I wrote the, the, the dialogue in English, and then a uh, uh, really good, you know, writer and screenwriter over there, Pete Lacaba, um, translated it into deep Tadog, Tagalog, mm-hmm. Tagalog that people might have spoken in, in 1900, and, you know, keeping in mind who was educated and who wasn't and all those other kind of character things that I'd given them. Mm-hmm. Um, but when the actors were acting, I didn't really understand line by line exactly what they were saying. And I would have to say to them, well, if you blow a line, you're going to have to tell me or, or, you know, tell that to my first AD or some of the other people who did speak to Tagalog to go- like on the set. I'm just listening for emotion here. Mm-hmm. I'm listening for the dynamics of the scene. Um, and and I found that I had no problem directing without understanding what the language was. You know, and in fact, it was easier in some ways because <laughs> right. I wasn't distracted by <laughs> the word. John, I had a friend say to me the other day that one of the greatest achievements in the life of an artist is the day that you can walk away from your day job and pursue your art full time. How do you respond to that? Uh, it is great. I mean, I, I wrote my first novel um, on unemployment insurance. Um, okay. I, they eventually, uh, <laughs> you know, the Christmas season had ended, and they didn't need as many meat packers to put out the amount of, you know, uh, abortsesi and pepperoni that we were making, and so I got uh, <laughs> laid off. Mm-hmm. And for, I think it was 24 weeks, mm. I got a, a whopping, I think it was uh, uh, $42 a week. Okay. Uh, which was just enough to pay the rent and eat. And so for those weeks, I, I had just um, gotten an offer to extend, extend a short story of mine into a novel by uh, Atlantic Monthly Press. Mm-hmm. And so I was able to, to sit in my freezing kitchen and just write. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I had to go back to work, you know, mm-hmm. after I handed the novel in. And that, that lasted for a couple years. Uh, eventually what happened is... Um, I, I threw the novels that I had written, which I was writing while I had factory and hospital jobs. Um, I got a, a, an offer from a, you know, a Hollywood screenplay agent to come out and write screenplays. And probably within about three months of uh, getting to Santa Barbara, um, I got a screen, screenwriting job uh, for Roger Corman and got paid... Ten thousand um, dollars for it because he was a, a signatory to the Writers Guild, and that was what minimum was in those days, uh, which was probably about two thousand dollars more than I'd ever made in one year. Mm-hmm. And you know, it was like a, a two-month job at the most. Um, and then I, I continued to get screenwriting jobs. So you know that that became my job, and you know, it is a job. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not writing my own stuff, sure. but um, it beats the other things I was doing. Mm-hmm. It certainly pays better, um, and so in, in terms of you know how much you make per hour, um, it's a lot better than even the meatpacking job, um, and it has some other benefits. You're 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 working with the muscles that you're going to use to write your own stuff. Um, you have a different mandate, which is when you're writing a screenplay for other people you're there to tell their story. It's not your story. 
um, and you're working as a technician, but you use almost all the same storytelling muscles that you use for yourself, um, and maybe even some more that you don't use for yourself, because you, you, you have to sell it a little bit more when you're writing for other people. Um, and uh, I'm one of the few directors I know who's met all these other directors and actually gotten to work with them. Um, directors don't get to work with other directors. Uh, writers get to work with directors. So, you know, I've gotten to work with, you know, Ron Howard and Jonathan Demme and Sidney Pollack and John Frankenheimer and, you know, the list goes on and on, Steven Spielberg, James Cameron, you know, and, and gotten this little window into, at least in the, in the story um, period, how they think, um, how they plan a movie, which is a, is a you know, a great kind of, uh, uh, kind of benefit of the you know the screenwriting gig you know you mentioned roger corman there i mean you know how, how mm-hmm. big how big was that you know the fact that you were hired for piranha um you know was, was that well, well it was huge in that i got to make a living right away and also it's very rare for a screenwriter to write three screenplays and have three movies made i mean roger it was if nothing uh, uh else uh an economical producer and so if he had somebody he paid somebody ten thousand dollars to write a screenplay it wasn't going he was going to pay anybody else any money to rewrite a screenplay <laughs> uh he was going to make that you know just kind of hand it to the director and say do what you can with it so i wrote three screenplays for roger in about uh, a year and a half two years maybe and they all got made so i got to I was on the set for a day on two of them. Um, I got to see the movie, see what worked, what didn't, talk to the directors, um, you know, get an idea of what was labor intensive and what was capital intensive, you know, what costs money and what can you just do with, you know, good work and, and lots of it and, and a little kind of, uh, you know, uh, tricky cleverness, you know, of, of how we're going to do this with less money than we really need to do this. Um, so in, in that in that way, it was a great school. Of you know, I didn't go to film school, but I did work for Roger Corman, and it was, you know, um, the other great thing about it at that time, anyway, is that there 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 wasn't the pressure on it that there is working on a studio movie. Studio movies cost so much um, that if your name is going on them and it's it's a failure, somehow that gets attached to your name. Nobody was paying attention to these B movies at that time. Uh, they didn't get reviewed generally, um, so the critics weren't paying attention to them. And even you know, Variety would kind of list them, but they were usually under the radar of, mm. you know, the business as it's called. Um, so that there, there just wasn't that kind of, oh God, we have to look at every single word here, you know, it, just in case somebody in Peoria may not like it. And if that opportunity never came along to write those movies for Roger, I mean, how, how much longer would it have taken you to sort of break into the movie industry, do you think? Oh, you know, who knows? You, know, you never know. You might never have broken in. You know, I, I, was, I was not, you know, um, living in Los Angeles. I was living up in Santa Barbara. I wasn't going to parties. Um, I, you know, I had written a couple things on spec, but, you know, mostly there were things that I wanted to direct myself. Um, so I was very lucky that there was that in, you know, I might have started working for TV and it would have been a longer apprenticeship. So it was great to, to get a bunch of features written and made Mm -hmm. that quickly. And then very soon after that, I, I wrote, uh, a couple movies for people who had been directors at Corman who had, you know, a slightly higher budget, you know, outside of his studio. And I did a couple rewrites for them. So I, I got into the, you know, onto the list of you know kind of acceptable writers pretty quickly mm-hmm. an interesting thing that happens though is that you get typecast as a writer just as you do you know a, an actor mm-hmm. so i i had written horror movies and for a long time i only got offered other horror movies to write and then i i wrote and directed this movie return of the caucus seven and people said oh he does human beings too <laughs> and then I started getting, you know, some, you know, offers for movies that there were just human beings in and nothing large that could eat them. <laughs> <laughs> and you mentioned uh, parties a few minutes ago, and uh, that segues perfectly into our next question, because I had read something where I think you asked Harper Collins not to throw a party for you. I don't know if that's correct or not, but 
you know, many creative people, including myself, are more reclusive. However, you know, networking is so important, of course, to a budding artist's career. Mm-hmm. How does one fight through that urge to hibernate when really they need to get out there and be social and spread the news of their project? Well, I think what, what, you, what you try to figure out is, is there a person you can be who can do that? You know, don't, don't play somebody who you're not going to be able to play again. Mm-hmm. And and it may be uh, it may be a strain, but you know go and and see there might be somebody interesting to talk to. You know it's it's I did not go to film school, and when I talk at film schools, you know I I, I kind of say you know I could have used about a week of film school. There were about five technical things I wish I knew when I directed my first movie, mm-hmm. and other than that, I don't think I really needed the help that film school would have done, except. Um, I often see people who met at film school and continued to work together. Oh, networking. Um, okay. Who just, they felt the same about films. You know, one, you know, Ernest Dickerson and, and Spike Lee, Ernest, Ernest shot a lot of um, Spike's early movies, and he shot uh, some of the Bruce Springsteen videos and Brother from Another Planet for me. You know, they really bonded in film school and came out, and it was a huge help to Ernest Dickerson to have Spike Lee you know, pick him as his cinematographer early on and have something to show that was a real movie. And it was a huge help to Spike Lee to have somebody as good as Ernest Dickerson, who was good right away as a cinematographer, shoot his first movie. So they were a lot more presentable and professional looking than often you get right out of film school. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I know a lot of people who have come out of film school. And, you know, in the first movies, people kind of do everything. And then after two or three movies, they kind of settle down and say, well, you know what I am is really I'm an editor or I'm a producer or I'm a director. Or sometimes what you find is, you know, I, I've had at least two, maybe three, yeah, three of my um, script supervisors have gone on to be directors. Hmm. Um, you know, so it, it may be that, okay, this is what I'm doing on this movie. Hmm. You know, I, I know a lot of young people right now who are making movies and it's just like, well, he was a cinematographer on my movie, and he needs somebody to, you know, be a grip on this one. <laughs> you know, and you go and you do it, mm-hmm. um, as long as you can afford to and as long as you can stand to. Mm-hmm. You know, David and I were discussing the other day that there are certain careers where you follow a specific course of action and you get a, a you achieve a planned result. For instance, if you want to be a doctor, you know it's going to be at least 11 years of school, you know, uh, four mm-hmm. years of med school, three years working in a hospital, and after all that effort, y- you get the payoff. However, the pursuit of filmmaking as a career is not promised. You know, someone can finish film school, as we talked about earlier, but there's no telling what will happen when it's done. Mm-hmm. There's no certainty. Um, you know, and so many people, they, they dream of being involved with films, but they chase another profession where there's just more certainty. How do we as filmmakers and artists deal with this uncertainty, both professionally and psychologically, you know, that results from following this path? How do we deal with the unknown? I, I think that uh, you, you have to embrace it mm-hmm. and uh, endure it, because okay. <laughs> it's not always fun. Mm-hmm. You know, I really don't generally know from movie to movie if I'm ever going to make a, another one again. You know, we, we haven't had anybody invest in our movies for the last three or four movies. We've had to raise the money ourselves, you know, and, and that means I've been writing a lot of screenplays for other people, and even that market is kind of drying up for me. So, you know, I don't know if I'm going to get to make another movie. Um, that's not new, however. It's Say not it like isn't so. Some, that would break my know, heart. There wasn't some, some, some golden age when I knew I could get, you know, money for movies. So, you you know that uncertainty that's what you know that's what uh songwriters go through that's what visual artists go through you know painters go through it's this is what i want to do mm-hmm. and if i if there's something else that i can do that i'll like better or if i just can't stand the uncertainty mm-hmm. um then you go do that other thing um but you know it's 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 nobody puts a gun to your head and sure. says you have to be an, an independent filmmaker or an avant-garde artist of any sort mm-hmm. or even have a rock band. Um, you do it because there are there, the thing itself is a reward. You like doing the thing itself. Um, and, that, and, and that may only last a certain amount of time. It may last until you're out of graduate school. Um, you know, or it may last until you're 40, you know, it may last until your third kid or your second marriage 
but uh, you know, uh, if you're lucky, you kind of keep that thing. And and yeah, I I, I think most people who continue to uh, even if they're very successful, um, create good stuff in whatever field, mm. it's because they still have stories they want to tell um, or paintings they want to paint, and and that's what they want to do. Yeah, I I, I, uh, I wrote a script that you know who knows it will, if it will ever get made into a movie. Uh, a rewrite on a script about Salvador Dali, and you know, with all his kind of public, you know, posturing and his wax m- mustache and all that, which was his pose because he was painfully, almost pathologically shy. He had to play that part. He still worked eight to ten hours a day painting, even when he wasn't that. You know, uh, he was just famous, and and you know, he was past his prime maybe as an artist. That's what he wanted to do was paint. Um, this is Film Courage. We are on the line right now with filmmaker John Sales. We have our close friend, actor Todd Cattell, here in studio with us. You know, John, being a professional filmmaker, um, it's not it's not just mastering storytelling and the art of filmmaking. Um, you also have to handle the business side of things, which includes distribution. Um, mm-hmm. You know, and, and every filmmaker, um, you know, especially all the ones tuned in right now, you know, we're all desperately trying to figure out the dis- distribution side of things. Um, the whole the club. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, the the whole landscape has you know it, it's changed dramatically. Um, and, you know, and, and especially in the last few years, um, you know, what light can you share? You know, what wisdom can you pass on to filmmakers who are looking to follow in your path? Well, the, the you know e- each time we make a movie, it's about you know even when we we're really uh, uh, kind of in the thick of it, it would be a movie every two years, let's say, or mm-hmm. or a year and a half. Uh, by the time that next movie is ready to go, the landscape has changed totally. You know, the business has changed totally, and that, that has been true since the very beginning. So right now, I would say there really is not an independent movie business. There are a few distributors left next year or two years from now. Um, if there's, you know, eight of them now, six of those names will be different. Um, you know, mm-hmm. things, you know, these companies go in and out of business very, very quickly. It's a very volatile kind of little industry, um, and, and to the point where it's not really even a, a, a sustainable industry anymore. Still, films sometimes somehow get on a screen, somehow make a lot of money. Um, some, some of that money goes back to the filmmakers, and, you know, all you need is one hit like that, and, as a distribution company, you're good for a couple of years. You can pay your staff and your rent and whatever for a couple of years. Mm-hmm. So there's still that, that dream, but um, there's just not as many of those movies. They don't stay in the theaters long enough to, um, you know, because, partly because there's so many of them, but partly just because the, the audience for them has shrunk. They don't stay in the theaters long enough to return enough that um, there are as many people who have a lot of money who are interested in investing in uh, independent films. So I, 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 I think that the future is less, left to be invented. Um, the question is, you know, and, and you know, there's some argument that you know, independent filmmakers will mostly always be first and second time filmmakers because they don't have to make money back they're working with their friends who aren't in the Screen Actors Guild yet, who might be interesting actors or interesting, you know, faces or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're not working with crews who have families and, and lifestyles to support, so they're not working with union people. Um, so they can make a movie for, you know, a hundred thousand dollars or two hundred thousand dollars or even less. Mm-hmm. Uh, the minute you start to work with Professionals, you know, people who are in the Screen Actors Guild, or you know, uh, the you know the various craft unions, IA people, or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, it's pretty hard to make something under a million. It's pretty hard to even make anything under five million. And then you better have a theatrical distribution and all the ancillaries to try to make some of that money back. So you know, it, there is another kind of filmmaking possible. Um, it's just that it's unlikely to be done on a professional level where the people actually make a living wage um, because the, the returns from new media um, have just been so low. Um, but you can make movies, and you can make good movies. Um, it's just that the, the hope to make a living at it 
Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I kind of feel like in the future, there, there used to be this phenomenon of the ski bum, who are these guys who could, you know, kind of find a cheap place to live in Aspen or Vail or whatever, and they'd kind of just follow the snow around and yeah. give lessons and, you know, kind of live off the the largesse of the rich people who did their skiing. Uh, I think in the future they're going to be film bums, hmm. you know, who who kind of are able to sustain it until they're 40 and their knees go, you know, or their, <laughs> their nerve goes or whatever. Um, but they won't exactly make a living at it, but they might make a lot of good movies. We have a question that's come in from our friend and also uh, prior guest, Sherry Candler, and it's in the same vein. Do you see there being more opportunities or less in the near future for indie filmmakers to get their films seen? Is the answer in pursuing distribution companies or in creating your own audience and platforms for your work? So basically either you are the studio or you need a studio. Well, you know, I've I've always felt like you know you you uh, don't have to just um, seize the means of production. You have to seize the means of distribution and exhibition mm-hmm. as well. Um, I, I go back to this thing of yes, absolutely. I think if you want your stuff seen and the the mainstream, very narrow bottleneck you have to go through um, is too narrow for you to get your movie through it, there are ways to get your stuff seen. It's just that you can't make a living at it. Um, certainly there should be more clubs that show movies. Uh, certainly there should be more m- movie theaters that have something like a bibliotheque where you can get just, just go in and, and watch, you know, non-mainstream stuff, you know, on, on video that's not necessarily with a big crowd. Certainly there should be all these other alternative ways to see movies, and I think filmmakers will end up just as, as, you know, for years and years and years, um, theater groups have formed when they could get a loft or whatever and they put it on in the loft because somebody's father owns the building or, mm-hmm. you know, there's a, there's a nice superintendent who will let them use it as long as they, you know, kind of clean up after themselves. Um, I, I don't think it's viable as a, uh, as, a, as a career to make a living, but I think it's very viable if you just want people to see your, you know, whatever work you made. Also, you're known to take money that you make as a script doctor on studio features and pour that money into your own personal work. Mm -hmm. So if you took away the Hollywood income and any monies that you make from your books or short stories, basically if we narrowed it down to the only money that you've made, you know, would it be from your independent films? I mean, is the only way to make a living as an independent filmmaker to have bread and butter coming from another outlet? Um, it, it depends. I mean, there are people, you know, I'm not one of them who, you know, uh, studios ask them to direct their movies and they get paid a lot for it. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not one of them. So I think okay. for a lot of filmmakers that's true, sure. but not for every filmmaker. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I think, you know, if, if you can see commercial movies being made that you'd be happy making and think that you do a good job making, that's something to take a whack at. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I know some very good filmmakers who are able to, you know, I know the Cohen brothers are able sure. to, you know, kind of work almost in the system. Mm-hmm. Um, there's other people who make very, very good, interesting movies. Mm-hmm. Um, it's rare that they have the kind of control that the Cohen brothers have over their movies. Um, but, you know, that's worth taking a whack at if you think, okay, these are mainstream, you know, my ideas are mainstream enough um, that uh, a lot of people would want to see them and I could work in that system. If not, you know, there is that other option. Mm-hmm. But uh, certainly, if I, if I had just relied on the, movie, the money that the movies themselves make, yeah. I probably would have stopped making movies about, oh, 15 years ago. Mm. Okay. Would you, John? I mean, you said, I'm not one of them. Would you go and do a, a, a studio movie for hire? I, I was always sort of had the impression that that didn't interest you. Uh, you know, if, if, if I liked the screenplay and I had control over the acting and the final cut, sure. <laughs> okay, we're, good. we're know, putting that out there. I hope you land again, a gig. There's, <laughs> there's, there's five or six directors who get that. You know, right. And once again, I, I actually had a studio executive once um, say, so, so why don't you come directing for us? And I said, would you give me final cut and casting control? And, and she said, if we gave it to you, we'd have to give it to anybody. Mm-hmm. And right. then she said, that sounds harsh, doesn't it? I said, no, I, I understand you totally. You can't justify 
you know, giving that kind of control, you know, in, in, in that corporate world that you live in to somebody who hasn't recently made you hundreds of millions of dollars. You know, that, that's just the, you know, it is a business. Well, I just wanted to go back, if I could, real quick, when you were talking about the, um, your process working with actors, and I'd asked the question about, you know, how, how you worked on set, and you said, well, the first thing is casting good actors. And, mm-hmm. and when you expounded on that, I, I was curious, what is it that when you're in the room and you're seeing 50 people come in, uh, what is the one thing that if it's an actor whose work you're not familiar with and you're meeting them for the first time in the moment in the room, what is it that says that, that you are drawn to cast that person? I mean, if it's that unknown actor and they get a substantial supporting role or even you know a leading one on an off chance, what is that thing in the room in that moment that allows you to make the decision to say, yes, I want to cast that, that actor? Um, you know, it's it's interesting because because sometimes the I want to cast that actor, but is is uh, amended with, but not for this production because mm-hmm. they're just not right. They're too old. They're too young. They're too short. Whatever, you know, for for whatever we're looking for, or the chemistry between them and whoever they're playing opposite, who we've already cast, is not right. Um, but I, I generally try to act with the person. You know, I'm usually, I don't have a, you know, production manager reading the lines that they're reacting to flat so that they're looking me in the eye and the camera, you know, the, the video camera's right next to me. Um, so I'm getting a sense whether, as I said before, if you throw them something different, will they react differently? Mm-hmm. Is, is there that, that you know, I, I don't want to see the only thing they can do in the audition I want to know that we can go on the set and and try some new stuff or some new approaches to a scene or, you know, who knows who the actor will be who's in the scene with them, and they're going to be able to react to that. Um, and then the second thing really is, um, am I paying attention? When you see 50 actors, and sometimes we see 25 actors in a day, um, you're like a zombie until somebody wakes you up. You know, and we really work hard to make it a good experience for the actors when they audition. But you know, you've seen a lot of people and you've heard those words before. Who wakes you up? Um, one of the the things I had to do was I uh, an important part in Amigo is for a woman who who you meet and she has a line or two, and then her daughter is killed halfway through, and then she goes crazy. In the, in the movie, she has maybe six lines mm. total. You know, um, and and never more than one or two at a time. So there wasn't really anything I could have this woman audition for. So you know, I gave the actress who came in for it. Um, you know, I, I wrote a little you know two page speech about a woman explaining you know her daughter getting sick and going to the hospital, and and her daughter just didn't come out. The doctors came out and said your daughter's dead. And I said, okay, this is the first time you've said this out loud to anybody you're going to be acting in Tagalog, you take this thing that I've just written on the back of an envelope in English, go in the next room, and in a half an hour come in and tell us this story in Tagalog as this character. And she told this story, and it made me cry, and I didn't mm-hmm. understand anything she was saying. Mm-hmm. So it's that other thing, is, is it's that almost intangible thing, is, does this person make me feel anything? We are truly honored that you are with us here today, and we want to thank you so much for giving us your time and this has just been a wonderful learning experience for us and, and uh, good luck to everybody out there in, in Twitter land yeah thank you and <laughs> it's, it's and tomorrow is that right that Amigo premieres uh, on the 14th 14th yeah. okay excuse me yeah, I you. do interviews tomorrow and, okay. and we're looking for distribution like everybody else you know okay. so that that's one of the nice things about the Toronto Film Festival it's, it's a place where we've often uh, been able to you know find a distributor for our movie very nice well, thank you. Yeah, yeah and our, our audience is excited no, to, to see your latest static. work, John. And, and, and we certainly hope that uh, that you'll find time in the future to, to rejoin us here at Film Courage. We, we thank you for being here today. Yeah, it's a great honor. Um, and, 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 and thank you for your lifetime of work that, that you've given to all of us. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And thank you to Dan, Danelle Myron for arranging this interview. And with that, have a great week.